Good evening, everyone. Welcome to another evening of Café Scientifique. April, we're hitting our stride, but late in the season. We're actually allowed to now have actually a few evenings on the trot, so we can get some momentum going. It's nice to see you all again here joining us. My name is John Willis, and I'll be your host this evening. Now, before I introduce this evening's speaker, let me uh, just give you the heads up because I'm sure many of you are familiar, we don't normally continue into April and May in any given year. So what we're doing this year is we're making up for basically January and February, right, when we had to cancel a few presentations. And so what we're hoping to bring you next month, so don't go on vacation yet, stay in Victoria for another month, okay? <laughs> we're gonna bring you another pair of presentations in May. And uh, I'll be emailing that out to all of you next week, something like that, just to give you all of those details. But uh, yeah, don't, don't hightail it out of Victoria just yet. There's reason to stay. Now, as you know, April is Orca Month, postponed Orca Month. We had a wonderful presentation last week, and we have another one this evening. Now, to give you kind of the context for this, when I was hoping to put um, Orca Month into, uh, into practice, I went to a wonderful presentation at CEOTHS, the School of Earth and Ocean Sciences, which is one of the departments at UVic. And they have, on Friday afternoons, they have their fireside chat series, which is not that dissimilar to Café Scientifique, you know, low presentation, just sitting around chatting, all very informal. And I saw this evening's speaker give a presentation, and I thought, that's going to be perfect for Café Sci. And thankfully, she said yes and was happy to join us. So this evening's speaker is Jennifer Vladichuk. And she, for a number of years, worked as a researcher specializing in cetacean acoustics in the group at CEOS, working with Stan Dosso there. I don't know if any of you know him. But that was where her connection with UVic. And then only just recently, she's gone on to work for JASCO. Now, many of you may not know JASCO. I didn't know it until I had a connection with it on Saturna Island, okay? This is where an uh, island I have a cabin on, so I spend a lot of time out at East Point bird watching and orca watching. And JASCO is uh, the company that uh, is basically paid by the federal government to operate the hydrophone system out there. So they're the people who are actually monitoring the effects of ship noise, right? The acoustic environment in which our whales live, right? And how our activities are affecting them. And so this evening's talk is going to involve all many kinds of stories like that. But the title is Story How I Became a Killer Whale Researcher, Stories from a Marine Biologist. So please join me in welcoming Jennifer to the stage. Thank you very much. Everything you need? Thanks, John, and thank you all for being here tonight. Um, I'm going to start with a bit of a disclaimer. Um, this is the first time I've ever given a talk without PowerPoint slides. <laughs> there are no slides on this laptop, but to play some sound clips for you later on. Um, so it feels a bit weird not to have slides, and I, I feel a bit like a stand-up comedian, but not a very funny one. So, <laughs> and uh, I'm going to apologize. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to apologize in advance if. Uh, I lose my train of thought or I uh, need to read my notes. I'm going to blame it on the baby brain. Um, so bear with me. Um, so tonight, as John said, I'm going to talk to you about uh, becoming a marine biologist and about uh, sound and acoustics, because that is my specialty, and why we study it and why it's important to study it. Um, but first, I'm going to go back and talk about how I became a marine biologist in studying acoustics, because I think it's a, a pretty interesting story and uh, kind of it shows where opportunities can just come out of nowhere. And uh, if there's uh, any aspiring marine biologists listening to this, uh, it could help them out in some way. And uh, shows that you can actually make a living as a marine biologist. <laughs> it's funny how many people I've talked to, and you know, you're talking about your job and what you do, and I say, I'm a marine biologist, and they're like, oh, I wanted to be a marine biologist. <laughs> so it is possible. <laughs> um, so I grew up in Tawasson, surrounded by the ocean. And I was very fortunate that my parents, who are actually in the audience tonight, uh, had a boat from when I was a baby, essentially. So uh, I grew up around the ocean and on boats, and I was very fortunate for that opportunity. And my love of the ocean developed at a really young age. Um, so there's actually three things that I wanted to be when I grew up. The first was an astronaut. 
but I don't really like flying. I just thought it'd be cool to go to outer space. Uh, the second was a gymnast, and I did that for as long as realistically possible. And third was a marine biologist. Um, so it was only natural after I finished high school that I went to UBC and did my Bachelor of Science in Biology. But near the end of my degree, I still didn't know what I wanted to do. I didn't know what jobs were available, and um, apart from working in an aquarium, and I didn't really want to do that. So um, has anyone had a, a sliding door moment in their life where something really insignificant at the time ends up changing the course of their life? Well, mine happened at the end of uh, third year at UBC, and I was in a huge auditorium with hundreds of students about to write an exam, and uh, I just so happened to be sitting near the front, which is unusual for me, <laughs> but I was sitting near the front, and so I was able to hear the professor make an announcement, and he said something about s a course studying whales, and I was like, the animal or the country? I don't know, but... I went up and talked to him later and I said, what was that that you were talking about? And he said, yeah, there's this two-week course up on the Central Coast studying gray whales. And I was like, awesome, you get credit for this? And sounds amazing, so sign me up. And uh, luckily there were four, uh, four of us that signed up, which is kind of wild. There were only four of us that were interested, but the course went ahead. And uh, so yeah, a few months later, I ended up uh, wandering the docks of Port Hardy looking for a boat called Stardust. <laughs> And little did I know that I would form a really strong relationship with this boat called Stardust. Um, so I don't remember what time we left Port Hardy, uh, but I very clearly remember that crossing. It was about five to six hours up to River Inlet, if anyone knows where that is. It was pitch black, it was dark, it was rough seas. <laughs> Everyone was throwing up on the boat, except me, because I guess my training as a baby um, on my parents' boat, and uh, I was just excited, didn't know where we were going or what we were doing, but I was looking forward to the experience. And uh, so we spent the next two weeks uh, on Stardust, learning how to drive a 40-foot boat, how to navigate uh, with paper charts and radar, how to conduct marine mammal surveys and take photo identification of whales. And uh, it was amazing, I just loved it. And uh, so again, with my experience on boats, as soon as the boat kind of pulled up to a dock, I grabbed a line and just naturally grabbed a line, jumped off and tied up the boat, and I was offered a job basically right then and there. And so uh, yeah, I spent the next six summers on Stardust and paddling a kayak. I'll get into that in a bit. And um, yeah, it was just an amazing experience. Um, but we worked really hard. Um, we essentially didn't have any days off for the whole summer. Sunday was our day off, which meant drive the boat to Port Hardy, refuel, get water, get groceries for 12 to 16 people for the week, uh, load that onto the boat. Maybe if we had time, go to the internet cafe, this was a while ago, uh, check your email, um, get in touch with friends and family, and uh, yeah, pick up the new group of volunteers. So we had uh, Earthwatch volunteers come and help us, uh, they funded our research and also participated and helped uh, with the studies that were going on in the field. Um, so yeah, we, we worked really hard, but it was uh, really rewarding and I'm very thankful to have that, that opportunity and time. Um, oh, and also we didn't get paid either. <laughs> um, so uh, we actually spent the, the first summer in Rivers Inlet and that was amazing. Um, it was in an old uh, fishing lodge, and we were staying in cabins over stilts over the water. There was a restaurant. We could just order from the menu. Like, it was very plush. <laughs> well, the lodge got sold, and we had to relocate. <laughs> so we moved to the southern end of our study area. It was about three hours um, out of Port Hardy on an uninhabited island. Nothing there except us. <laughs> um, there was, of course, no cell service, no running water, no electricity. We spent the part of the first summer living in tents until we built eight cabins for us and the volunteers to stay in. Uh, we, of course, had to bring all the wood over from Port Hardy on the boat, and that's a whole other story in itself. Um, haul all the wood up to camp, build these cabins. No one had ever built a cabin before. Um, but apparently they're still standing, and apparently they don't leak, which is amazing. <laughs> 
Um, that was a long time ago. I had a friend go over a couple years ago and she stayed in the cabins and he said, they're still there. They're still nice and dry and really appreciate it because it uh, obviously rains a lot up on the coast. So uh, she spent a couple nights there. So uh, we were studying gray whales along the coast. Um, and gray whales are an amazing species of whale. And uh, I'm glad to hear that Jason, our speaker from last week, is writing his next book about gray whales because they definitely deserve a book. Um, they are incredible animals. They were hunted to near extinction along this coast here. And uh, they were hunted to extinction or extirpation in the Atlantic Ocean, apart from the odd individual that shows up in the Mediterranean Sea somehow. I don't know if there's a portal from the Pacific, but um, every now and then you'll hear in the news there's a gray whale swimming in the Mediterranean. Um, and then there's a small population of a couple hundred individuals on the Asian coast. Um, yeah, so the, the gray whales along this coast um, have really rebounded. Their um, population is estimated to be uh, pre-whaling numbers, which is just incredible. Yeah, so they're off the endangered list and, and doing well. Um, they have one of the longest migrations of any whale. Um, they migrate from their breeding grounds down in Mexico up to their feeding grounds in Alaska. Can you imagine if that was our trip to the grocery store? <laughs> um, so th they're, they're yeah, really interesting animals. Um, they also behave almost like completely different species in the two areas. So down in up here, they're 100% focused on finding food. They don't care about people or boats. Um, they're just trying to find food. Whereas down in Mexico, they're completely different. They're, they're friendly. Um, they approach boats. They want to get a pet and a scratch. Um, it's a really interesting um, experience for anyone that wants to go down there. There's a couple lagoons that they congregate in to breed and have their calves. And uh, I was lucky enough to go down there for a couple months to help out with research. And um, I'll uh, talk about one incredible and somewhat terrifying experience that I had down there. Um, there were three of us in this panga boat, so it's about a 15-foot fiberglass open top boat and uh, we're conducting surveys and we were out and this whale approached us which wasn't atypical and we you know give it a little scratch and a pet and um but it wants a little bit more so it kind of was nudging our boat and the boat actually started to rock a bit so we're like oh should probably put our expensive camera gear and scientific equipment away put that in waterproof cases and um the whale kept you know pushing our boat more and more and we're kind of getting a little bit apprehensive and uh, felt a bit like just sitting ducks and totally at the will of this whale that's at least double the size of our boat. And we just were kind of sitting there. We pulled up the outboard engine because we didn't want it to scratch itself. And the whale just literally was pushing us down the lagoon and we were just sitting there like, we don't know what to do. And there was actually another researcher that was on the shore and watched this whole thing happen and came to us later and said, yeah, I was wondering what you guys were going to do about that. And... Uh, Anyway, we just sat there and let the whale do its thing until another boat came over full of tourists looking for a friendly whale. And uh, luckily, the whale went over and swam to them. We put down our engine, <laughs> said good luck, and <laughs> continued on with our survey. So uh, it was an amazing experience, but uh, one that you'll probably get if you go down to these lagoons in Mexico. Um, so the whole population doesn't migrate uh, all the way between Mexico and Alaska. There's like handfuls of whales that will spend their summer feeding along the coast uh, or even overwintering. You might have heard that gray whale in Harrow Strait or Caddy Bay that's been hanging around. So um, there's probably a juvenile which doesn't need to migrate all the way down to, to the lagoons in Mexico. It's not breeding, it's not having a calf. So some of them do overwinter up here. Um, so we were uh, connecting surveys along this about 40 kilometer stretch of coast. Um, we're taking photo ID to document who was there, uh, how long they were there, and, um, and, and how many throughout the years. So a one-way survey would take us about 10 to 12 hours on the boat. Um, so needless to say, over the six hours, I spent a lot of time on Stardust. And, uh, I have many stories, but I will share one really memorable one. And um, it happened super late at night. It was uh, at the end of one of the summer's field season. The crew was totally exhausted. We were all passed out, scattered all on the boat. And uh, William, who was the principal investigator of the organization, was driving the boat. And uh, 
And so all of a sudden it said, we're being torpedoed. <laughs> we're like, what? We all shot up. We're like, this is BC. Like, what? Torpedoed. And he just was like, go out on the, b- on the bow of the boat. So the pitch black, we're scrambling out to the bow of the boat. And sure enough, we can see these green flashes of light coming at the boat. <laughs> we're like, what is this? And we realized they were dolphins that were outlined, the phosphorescence was um, illuminating them. And it was just incredible. They were coming at us and bow riding, and I, it probably only lasted for a few minutes, but it's something I won't ever forget. And um, yeah, it's really interesting. Um, so over the course of my summers up there and observing these whales, I became really interested in their movements and patterns. So I would see a whale uh, move from like one point of land across the bay to another point or from one point to a kelp bed and then back to the point. I'm like, th- these whales are baleen whales, so they haven't been shown to use echolocation or biosonar to navigate. But I'm like, how do they find their way? Um, and they're not seemingly aimlessly, you know, swimming around. They seem like they know where they're going. Are there any scuba divers in the room? Uh, a couple, yeah. Uh, so you all know firsthand how murky the waters are here. You can't really see anything. <laughs> You're lucky if you can see your hand. Um, and whales don't have an exceptional um, eyesight, but sound travels really well underwater. Um, does anyone know how much faster sound travels underwater than in air? Close, three times faster. So in air, it's about 500 meters per second. In underwater, it's 1,500 meters per second. So a kilometer and a half in a second. So sound travels really well. So I'm like, maybe these animals are using sound, but they haven't been shown to use echolocation. So that was kind of my first thought for my PhD was, could they be using some sort of different type of echolocation? Um, But a very wise and experienced uh, gray whale researcher said, you'll be listening to nothing (laughs) most of the time. (laughs) I'm really glad I listened to him and talked to him, because I probably would. Uh, gray whales aren't th- known to be very vocal animals. So, um, so I ditched that idea and decided, okay, well, what sounds are in their environment that they could be using uh, to navigate or find food? So that's what I focused on. Um, and at the time, I knew nothing about acoustics. I'm not musically inclined. Um, I've been trying to learn the guitar for 20 years. <laughs> so um, it was a steep learning curve, but uh, that's kind of research for you. You... Uh, yeah, you learn as you go. Uh, and I'll never forget the, fir- the very first time I lowered a hydrophone, an underwater microphone, into the ocean. Um, it was up on the central coast, so it's pretty pristine. And uh, put down a hydrophone, and I could hear a boat. And I looked around, and I, I couldn't see a boat. Um, but I was pretty sure I heard a boat. So I was looking around, scanning the horizon. And sure enough, like way off in the distance, there was a boat. And I was like, must be that boat, but it's like kilometers away. Um, So it was really an eye or ear opening experience that sound can travel really, really far. Um, And because it travels so fast and that there's very few obstacles in the ocean, it does, it travels really, really far. Um, So what I did for my research was essentially uh, acoustically map two bays that the gray whales are known to feed in. One, and they're quite different. One was a really rocky, sheltered bay, lots of kelp beds, and the other was a a really exposed, sandy bay um, with one kind of big kelp bed in the middle. So what we did was paddled kayaks around and lowered hydrophone and and basically tried to map the bay because I wanted to know like what makes noise, where isn't there noise, and what these whales could be using. So, uh, and I was particularly interested in kelp beds as well because uh, gray whales in this area are known to feed in kelp beds. Their uh, primary food here, little tiny shrimp called mycid shrimp, and they form these large swarms, uh, tend to hide out in kelp beds or on like rocky features. So I was really interested in in what um, acoustics kelp beds fed. So I used kayaks as my research platform for a couple of reasons. One, we had them. (laughs) Um, And I didn't want to use the main research vessel um, because they were going to do their surveys, continue those. So I I didn't want to use that. Uh, They're free to operate, because I didn't really have any money (laughs) as a student. Um, And they actually turn out to be an ideal platform for making uh, recordings, because they 
they rock with the waves, whereas if you're in a larger boat, the surface waves actually hit the hull and make a lot of noise, and sometimes that's all you can hear. So kayaks uh, turn out to be yeah, a great platform for this. And uh, I'll always remember my first couple notes that I wrote in my, in my log book. Um, so we'd you know, paddle, lower the hydrophone down, I'd listen for about a minute, nothing. Okay. Paddle a bit more, put down my hydrophone, nothing. <laughs> It's going to be a really short thesis. <laughs> um, <laughs> but over the, the course of the summer, I, my ears became pretty finely tuned to those small differences in sound. And um, you know, I could, with just listening, determine, you know, are we close to shore? And I knew if it was rocky, sandy, gravel. Um, I knew if we were close to kelp beds versus the open ocean. I knew like even what the weather was, if there was some surface noise or big waves or rain. Um, so I'm sure you know whales and gray whales um, would be able to be even more finely tuned. Of course, that's their only habitat. They probably only or mainly use sound, and um, yeah. So I'll, I'll actually so I'm going to play the a couple sounds here so you can um, hopefully hear some of these differences. The real test is: did you find anything to eat? Did you find the drift net? Oh. <laughs> No, because I was looking for burritos. <laughs> okay, so for this first one, Tom, this is the really quiet one. We'll see if we can hear it. So it's just kind of snapping, sounds like popcorn. But that's pretty much what a kelp bed can sound like. Because all the critters that are in there. These, I think they're urchin. So that we have like snapping shrimp, shrimp down in um, more tropical waters. There's actually some echolocation in there, if you can hear. That's the echolocation. Cool, thanks. Um, so that snapping, really associated with, with kelp beds. If you're close to that, there's creatures, I think they're urchins, um, making noise. But uh, that's a good example of what, kind of what a kelp bed sounds like. So now we'll play this other one, just open water. We'll see what this sounds like. A really short clip, but um, there's a little bit of a jingle. It's kind of some mooring noise. But yeah, no snapping. You don't really hear much. Um, play that one later. Okay, so that's just a little sample of <laughs> some differences that you could possibly hear. Um, so my research showed that there, there was a significant difference in sound levels near a kelp and away from kelp. And as you heard from the snapping and different critters in there, they, they're kind of like a source of noise. So uh, the whales definitely could be using that as kind of a beacon of sound and, and narrow in on them. But I also discovered that um, kelp bed, because it's gas filled, and I'm talking about uh, bull kelp, you know, the long, we have a lot of it here, long stipe um, filled with gas. But because of that difference in density between water and, and gas, it, uh, they actually reflect sound really well. So, um, uh, so you can imagine, you know, you're a whale, and in that one bay, that big sandy bay, um, there's a lot of surf noise. And, uh, as the whale is swimming along, you can probably hear that surf noise, but as it gets behind that kelp bed, it actually creates this acoustic shadow because it's reflecting the sound back. So it could hear like, okay, well there's a difference, just like we could potentially hear here. If there's like a big building in the way, it's gonna cancel that sound. So it could pick up on that as well. So that was pretty interesting. Um, yeah, so I concluded that whales, you know, you can't definitively say yes, for sure the whales are using this, but you know, it's possible. There's cues are there. I could differentiate the sounds. Most likely a whale is going to be able to as well. Um, I also think that it's possible that they use some form of active acoustics. So not your classic echolocation where it sends a high frequency click and gets a reflection back. But I'll try to play these. They're not the best clips, but they're actually of a humpback whale. So it's cool humpback whale sounds. Um, yeah, one where it's quite clear and there's other, the other one has like a bit of reverb, so it's being kind of echoed off uh, the walls nearby. So we'll try this. It's 
is a humpback whale. That sounds like a horse dragon. I don't know. <laughs> okay, now here's some more, um, what I think has a little bit more reverberation. Another one. Anyway, kind of hard to tell. They're not the best clips, but just even from that, that difference in sound, like reverb vers versus not, like that would be open ocean versus like in like, uh, you know, in an inlet where you have the rocky walls that are gonna reverberate the sound. So it's possible they could even just be using that. So like just a low frequency, they're calls, not clicks. Anyway, so while I was doing my PhD, I, uh, I was reading about blind people and um, related research and how they could be using sound. And uh, it kind of inspired me to do an experiment on myself. So while I was walking home from university, I would close my eyes occasionally and, and just listen to the sounds around me. And it was amazing what I could pick up that I wasn't necessarily picking it up with my eyes. Uh, for example, as I was walking along, close my eyes and I could hear the echoes from my footsteps if there was a wall beside me. Uh, there wouldn't be echoes if there was a driveway there. Uh, I could tell my footsteps would sound different what, depending on the substrate I was on, like pavement, grass, or gravel. Um, also, if there were trees that were, had leaves in it, you know, the wind would make noise through them. Um, just the intersection and, uh, you know, traffic volume, you know, what kind of road conditions were like. Um, so it was really fascinating, and I, I actually still do it to this day when no one's looking. <laughs> Close my eyes and just trying to take in the sounds around me. And I actually invite you right now to all close your eyes and just take a moment to listen to what's around us. So it's a pretty quiet room, but outside it'll be much different. But you can tell probably hearing the, you know, clanging of dishes that the kitchen's behind us. Could you tell that there were, that we were inside versus outside? Just because it's so quiet, right? There's no other sounds around. Um, couldn't everyone was really quiet, so you couldn't really hear other people. But there was someone talking over there, so you know that there's you know other people around you. Anyway, I invite you to to close your eyes every now and then when it's safe to do so outside and just. Um, listen to the acoustic environment. It's, it's, you really tune into things that you don't necessarily do with your eyes, and it um, kind of opens, yeah, up another world. <laughs> um, yeah, so sound is really important to um, aquatic species. They use it, you know, to navigate, find food, attract mates, defend their territory. So it's really important that they live in an environment where they can hear these sounds. But humans also like to make a lot of noise underwater. Most of us are completely unaware, and I was as well until I put down the hydrophone the first time and heard a boat kilometers away. I'm like, well, okay, um, yeah. So, um, but it's it's quite an emerging topic in research and um, research and in industry. And there's um, yeah some really interesting measures that are um, happening along this coast to try to reduce our impa impacts underwater. For example, has anyone heard about the uh, vessel slowdown trials? That yeah, it's been in the news. Yeah, the it's uh, initiation of the Port of Vancouver actually um, to impose a speed limit on commercial traffic throughout certain times of the year. It's normally when the southern resident killer whales are around. And um, yeah, the company I work for, Jasco Applied Sciences, like John was saying, we have a, a recorder in Boundary Pass, and so we monitor the sound levels before, during, and after these slowdowns and quantify uh, the difference in sound levels and also the participation rate of um, the vessels involved. Because it's actually voluntary. I think they get a bit of monetary incentive to do it, but um, it's amazing. 80, about 80% 80 of vessels slow down to these speeds and it's 
it really does help. There's a significant drop in, in sound level. So they've been doing it, I think, for about five years now. And uh, they keep doing it and keep extending it to different areas. So it's really great. So the next clips I'm going to show are uh, play are actually um, of vessels, of boats, to give you an idea of the, the difference that uh, between going fast, going slow, and different types of boats there are. Um, so Tom, these might be loud. <laughs> So this is just a slow commercial vessel. Now I'll do a faster commercial vessel. I'll do the slow one just one more time. But typically when vessels are going faster, they have more high frequency, um, which can be quite annoying. Now this one might be, I'll turn it down a bit, this might be loud, this is a, a speedboat. So yes, very annoying. <laughs> What's that? Going to the dentist, yeah. Um, so uh, a reminder to any pleasure boaters out there to go slow when you can, and especially around uh, animals, because your boat is probably very loud underwater. Um, right, so this talk is supposed to be about killer whales, right? <laughs> well, I'm saving the best for last. Um, so I had another sliding door moment a few years ago, um, which is kind of a funny story if you want to ask me about it. But uh, it ended up with me doing a, a postdoc at UVic um, in collaboration with DFO to study uh, southern resident killer whale acoustics. <laughs> and as probably you, uh, a lot of you know, um, the southern residents, their numbers aren't doing very well. Um, and as Jason talked about last week, a lot of them were captured for aquarium around the world. Um, so that reduced their numbers. And then now there's a number of other factors, um, vessel disturbance, uh, including noise, um, lack of food and pollutants are all contributing to their lack of uh, kind of increase in numbers. So I was tasked with uh, trying to record their echolocation because actually not much is known about their characteristics, and in learning about it, we can understand how noise might be affecting their ability to find food. Well, it seemed like a simple task <laughs> when I started the project, but I quickly realized why no one has ever done this before. <laughs> Since echolocation is really high in frequency, it actually decreases with distance really quickly, as opposed to low frequency sound, which has larger wavelength and can travel much further. Uh, it's also very directional, so you imagine like a flashlight, like a beam of light, the, the same thing with um, echolocation, it has a very narrow beam. So the first step, which I thought would be the easiest, would be finding the whales, which actually turned out to be the hardest. <laughs> um, the Salish Sea might seem like a small body of water, water but when you're in an 18-foot zodiac uh, it, looking for a whale, <laughs> it's, uh, it's pretty big. Uh, so we spent our first summer, we spent about 20 days. I was working part-time at JASCO at the time as well, so we didn't, I couldn't put 100% effort into it. We spent 20 days at sea doing these surveys for the whales. Uh, we would leave Beecher Bay in Souk and drive out past Port Renfrew uh, every day <laughs> searching for these whales. And we did that for 18 days. Uh, we didn't find the southern residents until the last two days out on the water. <laughs> Thankfully, at least, we got some data, but um, yeah, it was, it was not easy and frustrating. Um, so once we found the whales, we tried to determine like which direction they were traveling, which that also wasn't easy because out on Swiftshire Bank, they could go any which way. Um, you know, but once we kind of figured out, okay, I think they're going that way, we would uh, try to position ourselves about 500 meters in front of the whales, again, try to guess like which line they were going so we could put our equipment, it needed to go right in front of them to catch that pretty narrow beam. Um, we were also using a two meter by two meter, kind of a big curtain of hydrophones um, to put in front of them. Two meters by two meters seem really big on an 18 foot zodiac, but again, it's not <laughs> in the wide open ocean. One whale coming at you, you try to be right in front of it. Um, yeah, needless to say, it was really difficult. Um, Oh, and also the, uh, well, they needed to be swimming at us and they needed to be echolocating, which wasn't always the case either. 
We also wanted the weather to be decent so we could put our equipment in the water. And out on Swiftshire Bank, there's easily two meters swell and fog a lot of the time. So uh, we needed a lot of things uh, to line up for us to get some data. And uh, so we had two years out there, our second year, we uh, kind of refined things and were able to get a few, few more days of data. So what we were trying to do with this like two meter by two meter big contraption of 23 hydrophones was put that in front of the whale, hope they're echolocating, but the, each ping would uh, you know, arrive on a hydrophone at a different time. So from that, you could triangulate where the whale was positioned and know the range to the whale. So we can calculate the sound level of the click and also know the frequency, which is really important. Um, so from that, we can calculate essentially the reflection off a salmon, which is possible. So again, the uh, swim bladder in a fish is filled with gas. So it reflects the sound really well, just like the kelp does. Um, so yeah, knowing these characteristics of the level and the frequency, we could estimate you know, what portion of the signal is being reflected off the salmon and compare that to noise levels in the ocean. And knowing, okay, well, at that frequency, what is the, the noise level? And then so we can look at what distances between the whale and the salmon and also different levels of ambient noise and how is that, at one point, does that start masking their echolocation? Okay, so to, to end my talk, I'm gonna play a few more clips of killer whales because I know that's what you've all been waiting for um, and see if you can hear the difference. So I'm gonna play southern resident killer whales, also the other type of killer whale, transient or Biggs killer whale and uh, we also have, we're gonna play some northern resident killer whales. And they aren't normally found around here, but uh, another acoustics consulting company, SMRU, recorded northern residents in Indian Arm actually a couple months ago. And that's the first time apparently they've ever been um, detected in, in Indian Arm. And it's a really, really great recording. So I'm gonna play those now. See if you can uh, pick up the difference. So that was a southern resident killer whale. I'll play a few more of them. So that's like a different kind of call that they have. So you can hear the, the clicking, the echolocation, and also all that, that surface noise. This was done from a bigger boat, so you can hear all that surface noise hitting the side. Uh, so now I'll play some transient, see if you can hear the difference. To me, they sound more like a kazoo and a little bit like creepier. <laughs> I'll play the southerns again, just see if you can tell the difference. Anyone hear the difference? Yeah? Thanks. <laughs> Took me... Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it took me, I don't know, years of listening to them and being able to tell the difference and recognize they all have calls, different calls as well, I'll pick those up. So now we'll hear, I'll play the, uh, the northern resident one, it's just, it's beautiful.
So they sound a lot like Southern residents. I mean, someone sent me that clip, and first they called them transients. I'm like, I don't really sound like any transient I've heard. And I don't really sound like Southern residents, any of the calls I know. So I, I asked for the, the recording. I'm like, can you send me the real, the raw recording? And they did, and then sure enough, there was a whole bunch of emails back and forth, and then John Ford, who's from DFO, and like, you know, the... Kilowell Acoustics Guru came back and said, yeah, those are northern residents in Indian Arm. That's the first time they've been recorded. So pretty neat. And yeah, it's just a really great recording. Um, yeah, one more. This is I call flirty uh, southern resident Kilowell. <laughs> anyway, that's all I have for you tonight. Thank you very much for attending and listening. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jennifer. What a wonderful auditory window <laughs> that opened up. That was a magical experience. Are we lucky to live here? Yeah. I think so. Now, I'm going to be on my best behavior tonight, so when you ask your questions, I'm going to repeat them for the audience watching on the live stream. So do we have any questions for Jennifer? We have. Oh, I'm going to make sure I go around the room. I'm going to start here with the front row. Yes. Yep. Uh, so I'm going to repeat the question. Is there any measurable or discernible Doppler effect underwater? Yeah, similar to in air. Um, so Doppler effect is when uh, the sound source is moving, like say an ambulance. And um, because of the speed that it's traveling, the, um, the sound will kind of accumulate as it goes. Um, and same underwater. We have the same, same effect if the source is moving. I mean, that's an interesting point because we know of so many creatures in air that exploit Doppler effect and this kind of thing to actually catch prey. I'm thinking of bats. Mm -hmm. And it just tells us all these things we, we don't know about, you know, cetaceans in terms of how they might exploit that, mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. in, in, in their life cycles. Mm -hmm. Now, I did see we had another question over there, please. So th the question was, from the calls from the orca, are they prey specific? Are they talking to each other? <coughs> and I guess this all gets to the, the, the key question of context. Mm. What's going on that you can't see under the water? Yeah, yeah, that's a, it's a difficult question to, to answer, and researchers are trying to do that. Um, a lot of the time what they can do is, it's called the focal follow. So if they are recording, they can also observe the behavior of the animal while they're, they're making these different calls. Um, I don't know if it's prey specific, but it's definitely um, seems to be with context. So there are certain calls they'll make when they're more just having fun, it seems, and, and playing, as opposed to like foraging. Uh, they have more certain calls that they make, as opposed to when they're traveling, they'll make other calls. So, oh, Windows is updating. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, so yeah, it seems to be context specific, but there's, we're still discovering, yeah, what they're used for. So I'm just going to go to a question we had there in the corner. So I understand that the, as you described, gray whales are rather quiet. What things, I don't want to say they can't, but they're not usually used for hunting. They're usually used for hunting. Does this say anything about their relative intelligence compared to killer whales? Are they seem to be more intelligent? Oh, that's a, that's a very interesting question. So let me paraphrase it. Is the degree of vocalization linked to the intelligence of the whale? Right. And let me ask you a question. Is the degree of vocalization linked to the intelligence <laughs> of the... <laughs> no, the intelligence of the human. We've seen such, such variety over the past few months in terms of how vocal some people are willing to be. That's a very interesting question. Jennifer... And one I don't think I want to answer. <laughs> I'll let you take that one on. Maybe. <laughs> um, I don't know about just how vocal they are, probably their behavior, their relationships with each other. Um, they, they're not social as social as, you know, killer whales are in their, their pods and their families. Gray whales are pretty individual, so that's one of the reasons why they, 
they don't vocalize as much. Um, they do more so down in Mexico make more sounds, um, and that's when they're being more friendly and social and yeah, mating. So. I think yes. There was so I, I'm I'm not going to ignore you. I, I've seen your hand, but I'll, I'll go to this this gentleman first. So So that's a good question. So with your two by two meter, <laughs> 23 hydrophone array, can you detect vocal teamwork in the, in the, in the orca? We're not there yet. <laughs> um, humpback whales do when they're bubble, feed bubble net feeding. Um, one will blow bubbles, um, create this essential uh, net with bubbles, while one is vocalizing, which seems to trap uh, the sound, because of the bubbles, again, air versus water, trap the sound inside that and scare the fish inside. So humpback whales are known to do that. Killer whales, definitely possible. <laughs> yep. uh, uh, killer whales are so interesting because we've all got such anecdotal evidence from our own experience of seeing them do things that are a little bit weird or canny or this kind of thing. Certainly, you know, in terms of, I just wanted to give a couple of great, you know, um, book recommendations after after Jason's talk last week, you know, you had a, a wonderful book story. <coughs> is I haven't read yet Alexandra Morton's book, Listening mm. to Whales, mm. right? But it's on my list. But one thing I really liked was Billy Proctor's Heart of the Rain Coast, mm. where he talks about all the different things he's seen. He learned how to fish from watching the orca, right? And they them knowing, you know, where to exploit and when to exploit this kind of thing. Um, yeah. Now there's a lady there at the back there with a question. So the, the question was, we, we know of some differences between the, um, uh, the southern resident killer whales, or the northern residents, and the transient whales, or big killer whales. Now, do you, do you see that? And you, you talked a little bit about the, the northern, sorry, the, the transient sounding a bit different, but how mm -hmm. quantitative is that? How, how different do they actually sound and operate vocally? Mm. So they, they don't <coughs> tend to make uh, as much sound or as vocal as the southern residents. Um, when the southern, southern residents come around and we capture them or record them on the hydrophone, it's just almost continuous. It's like they're talking over top of each other and always talking. Whereas um, the, the transients, sometimes I think they'll just pass through and not make a sound. Um, one of the reasons is that uh, they're feeding on marine mammals, which can hear their sounds as well. So uh, the transients actually want to be more stealth than the southern resident killer whales, um, so they can afford to be more vocal. So that's one, yeah, one difference between them. Jason, I see you have a question. So the, the, the question was, right, as, as, you know, taking as given the fact that the Salish Sea is a, a, is a noisier place over time, there's evidence that the, the transient whales are actually doing well. Their, their population appears to be increasing as opposed to the southern residents, which is under pressure, right? And, you know, how does, you know, the fact that these two whales operate different acoustically match that kind of noisy Salish Sea, you know, situation? Mm -hmm. So there could be a couple different explanations for that. Um, one, that the transients are around more than they ever were. Um, so the seal and sea lion population is probably quite healthy. So there's just more food for them now than there were before. Um, southern residents also need quiet. They need to be able to hear their echolocation, which, like I said, the high frequency doesn't travel very far. So they actually need it to be quite quiet to hear those echoes. 
Um, but I also think like a lot of, you won't hear um, or see transients and residents in the same area. They seem to stay apart for some reason. Um, so as the southern residents, they haven't really been in the area nearly as much as they used to be. So as they've kind of maybe moved to other areas, like out on Swisher Bank, where we found them a lot of the time, um, that kind of opens it up for the transients to kind of move in. So it might not be necessarily acoustic related, but just shifting of, yeah, of ecosystems. And I think that's a, that's, a, that's a very good point that there's, you know, in scientific speak, there's multiple variables going on, right? There's, mm -hmm. there's the, you know, the basic supply of food for each species, there's the conditions that they would like in which to find that food, and then there's the fact, do they actually share territory or do they like to keep separate? There's a lot mm -hmm. of, you know, different dynamics going on. Yeah, it's never a simple one factor no. <laughs> explanation. No. Now, we've got time for a last couple of questions if anybody is interested, though it looks like, oh no, there's a, thank you very much, <laughs> I didn't see. Sharon, you have a question. Oh, that's a good question. So are the southern residents in danger from the, the transients? I wouldn't say so. It, I don't know if it's been documented much or at all, um, of transients going after the southern residents. Yeah, because they just don't want to stay sort of together in one place here and then they don't yeah. want to go back to the other. Which is surprising because um, transients can go after gray whales which are bigger than killer whales. But maybe it's because they're in big pods. Um, you wouldn't mess with, you know, 10, 15 whales when there's just a few of you. But um, so not necessarily. The calves are always probably um, a bit um, susceptible to hunts. But I, I don't think there's been much documented of transients going after residents. No. But they seem to keep their distance. <laughs> All right, I see, I see another question there at the back. Right. So mm -hmm. let me make sure I get it right. But the, the question was that, that, you, that you saw essentially a superpod, right? Um, which is, so is it only ever southern residents or do the whales now, which exact words were mix it up? <laughs> yeah, do, do, do the whales ever mix it up? <laughs> Good question. I, um, I know of one recording where we heard both southerns and transients in the same recording. So it's possible they could be together, but not likely. So most likely it would all be residents together. Um, and yeah, super pods happen where all, all three pods kind of get together, um, socialize, and that's when they're really vocal. Um, yeah, but uh, yeah, there was actually a, um, in the news just like yesterday, I think of the humpback whale mm. kind of with the transient. So um, they do kind of <laughs> sometimes <laughs> intermingle, but uh, again, like it, it's pretty rare. They seem to keep their distance for whatever reason. Now, just correct me if I'm wrong, but the, the status of the transients compared to the southern residents, they're what's called an ecotype. Mm -hmm. They're not a separate species, mm -hmm. right? So, but they're, they're, they e exhibit enough differences that we can't put them all into the same pot, mm -hmm. right? But that means if they, if they wanted to, they could breed and have viable offspring. <laughs> yes. <Right. laughs> the term species um, it is it's an fluid, interesting yeah. one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Essentially, that means that they could interbreed and have a viable offspring. Maybe they could. I don't know if it's but been we don't documented. Know if they do, yeah. yeah, I don't know. Um, but there's been uh, between two different species, I believe the doll's porpoise and the harbor porpoise that have interbred and had a viable offspring. So those are two different species. Do you, do you have two more questions in you? Yes. Okay, <laughs> you've been very good. No, I, I, I saw, it. I've seen that one. I'm just going to do. <laughs> this <laughs> always happens, you know. Let, you know, you try to answer a question, it leads to another question. Let's start with this gentleman here, at least. Southern residents, they can, they can go after a lot of these other whales, 
Oh, right. Good, simple question. We like that. Thank you. <laughs> Do the southern <laughs> residents only go up to Robs ever go up to Robson Bay, or is not that just the northerns? Yeah, not that I know of, but um, anything is possible. You know, now we're getting southern or northern residents down here. Uh, apparently, they do. Um, I think John Ford was saying, like every winter, it, it the northern residents do come down to the kind of northern Georgia Strait, but way into Indian Arm, that was unusual. Um, but no. anything, go yeah, anything goes. It's possible, but the not that I know of. Yeah. My geography is not so good. Where is Indian Arm? Indian Arm. Um, <laughs> I'm from Vancouver. So, uh, yeah, English Bay into False Creek. Okay, so it's, it's right there it's in Vancouver. It's really, okay. yeah. Okay. No, sorry. Under the Lionsgate Bridge. Okay, Vancouver Harbor, go left. All right. Now, oh. I don't know, but we're getting waves of, of enthusiasm from the audience, <laughs> ebbing and flowing. Right, no, I'm going to go to this, this lady over here. Hi, Catherine. Oh, wonderful question. What are you going to do Haven't next, been. Jennifer? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So I, I, I work at Jasco Applied Sciences, so it's a local uh, acoustics consulting company. So, um, yeah, we do a, a number of projects. Um, you know, any sort of construction near shore that produces sound. So pile driving, didn't get into any of this, but pile driving is super loud underwater. So they have to monitor those sound levels. So um, yeah, we get contracted to do that. Um, even BC ferries, they're trying to reduce their noise. So we put recorders out to measure the ferries and try to help them reduce their noise footprint. Um, so yeah, continuing on with JASCO and the, the underwater acoustics consulting that we do. <laughs> Thank you. All right, I'm go we're going to do two. Um, we're, we might wait till we the post question <laughs> session. We're going to do two questions because you've been patient and you've been very enthusiastic, and I don't like to dampen the enthusiasm. So, uh, quick question from you. Yeah, I'm just curious. You mentioned that you uh, have an extra video camera in the regional Alberta Hub. Do you find that other provinces have built similar rules in terms of uh, what is predominantly required or what you might need? On the Billboard magazine list of whales, <laughs> <laughs> what, what's currently in the top three, would you say? Oh, gosh. That's, uh, that's a good question. Um, so a lot of the baleen whales do make low-frequency, kind of repetitive sound. Um, a lot for, I don't know, for uh, breeding, mating, uh, attracting mates. And these sounds, because they're so low-frequency, like below our hearing range, uh, will travel across the ocean so they can communicate that way. Um, but uh, it, it's a toss-up. I don't um, <laughs> Blue whales, fin whales, they make sound. Minky whales make some noise, but not like the killer whales. They're very vocal mm. um, compared to the other species. Um, Sperm whales are very well studied as well. Yeah. Right, because they're not baleen whales, right? And they're, you know, but they, they're almost like, from what I can tell from the literature, killer whales on steroids. Steroids. They're bigger creatures, right? But they have the the hunting vocalizations, right? The food vocalizations. But they're incredibly social. There's a lot of research into essentially the clans, which are equivalent of pods among the sperm whales as well. So I think they're quite. Yeah. As popular. far as I know, I think they just uh, produce clicks mm. uh, in echolocation, yeah. but they're different types of clicks. So they have like social clicks versus yeah, foraging or hunting clicks. Um, but yeah, that's yeah. overview. Now, I'm going to take one more question from this lady. But then I will say to anybody who would like to continue the conversation, please feel free to come up once we've thanked Jennifer. So last question. No, that's, that's, a, that's a really good point. So might it be that the southern residents that are echolocating to detect salmon give away the presence of killer whales in the area, mm -hmm. and that kind of reduces the hunting efficiency for the transients who are after you know, you know, 
seals, sea lions, this kind of thing. That's as, as a conjecture. So you can feel free yeah. to speculate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a really good question. And there's actually a, a student at, at East studying the effects of sound on Chinook salmon. So we'll know more about that in a couple years. But uh, it, it, that's a good point that uh, the sounds that the southern residents make could, um, well, definitely the you know other marine mammals would hear that, but they're not as interested in southern residents. So, um, but if they heard a transient, you know, obviously they would, you know, skedaddle. But um, you wonder if the the transients are smart enough to mimic. <laughs> if if there was any, you, know, you wouldn't yeah. put it past them, would you? Yeah. Right. Surprising they haven't done that yet. Yeah. <laughs> what a wonderful talk. What wonderful questions. Let me just remind you before we thank Jennifer that you, if you have any questions that I didn't get to, I apologize, but please feel free to come up and uh, you know have a conversation with Jennifer at the end. We hope to be back in May. We've got a couple of talks lined up. I'll be letting you know about the, them soon. So please join me now in thanking Jennifer for a wonderful talk. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>